believe with 520 as well, but with 15 Central Park West, 220 at 30 Park Place, there's this obsession with uh, limestone. What is the obsession with limestone? Well, 30 Park Place is only limestone at the bottom of the building, the rest of it is precast, to be mm -hmm. truthful. Um, but I, a limestone, a limestone is a beautiful material. There are many different kinds of limestone from different quarries. Um, it is solid. It gives a sense of permanence and dignity to the building. Uh, I have nothing against glass. We've done the Comcast Tower in Philadelphia, which is 975 feet tall, and it's all glass. But in my mind, and in the minds of many people, and not certainly to buy into our buildings, glass represents corporate office buildings, uh, the workaday world of work. And stone represents permanence, elegance. And stone captures the light beautifully. Glass buildings are often impenetrable. They say glass is transparent. You can't see it to any glass building except maybe in the evening where you get a beautiful view of the cleaners going around. And stone allows us to have wonderful details, uh, window frames, thickened walls, because the stone is usually but not always mounted on precast panels, sometimes on a metal construction. Well, lots of things, I mean, I want to make buildings that have, that are elegant. Of course, everybody says they want to do that, but have a sense of permanence. A lot of architects, philosophically, want to make buildings that look like they're being deconstructed. I like to make buildings that look like they were constructed. Right. So there's a big difference in philosophy. To be honest with you, when I saw that 30, Park Place for the first time. I thought it was a conversion, I, I, but it, you know, it looked like it was there for a very it's long time. It's very closely based on my favorite, probably, of the 1920s Lower Manhattan buildings, number one Wall Street, the old Irving Trust building. Mm -hmm. So it's my homage to it. Yes. So uh, it's, you know, in the world of painting, mm -hmm. many artists, many, many artists get high praise for reinterpreting artists before. Picasso reinterpreted many artists from before. I'm not Picasso, but I'm not so far away. Mm -hmm. And others, um, Richard Prince, all appropriation art and so forth. So I think art is about art. Art derives things. And frankly, if we're going to get high-minded about it, I suppose, <coughs> the argument that all these glass buildings that are being built now are somehow a projection of the 21st century. Anybody who knows architectural history 101 can find sources for every one of the buildings that are being uh, done in glass today. Even the super modern ones that you were saying. They're not that modern. <laughs> They're just aggressive. Right. <laughs> How do you uh, provide uh, the buyers uh, for these condo buildings with all the new bells and whistles that they expect on the inside? Well, the first thing is when we did 15 Central Park West, and a little bit even before the chat, but 15 was the key Thing. The argument that our clients pose to us, Zeckendorf's uh, and, and some of their partners, well, we're facing the park. Why should we make it all glass? So we made a huge mock up in our office. We had, uh, well, we're moving, but we had 14 foot high ceilings. Um, and we made a full size mock up. And we showed them that if it's an all glass building, it still has to have columns. So you have columns in front of the windows, and you look at all the renderings of the glass buildings, particularly the ones that are going to be built on Riverside Drive. Uh, now there are big color renderings in the Times on the weekend. They have columns right in the corner. And also there's no place to hang a picture. There's right. no place to right. put a piece of furniture. Everybody sitting nervously perched on those sofas, <laughs> hoping that they will be blown out of their apartment. <laughs> those are not our clients. Our <laughs> clients have art, have furniture, they have taste, they don't buy, <laughs> they don't go to West Elm, um, I'm sorry, and they, and they love the walls. And we had huge windows, we have huge windows with walls between the windows. What do people do, sit in their apartments staring out the window all day long? I don't. I was recently on the, in the penthouse floor of 432 Park Avenue, and I wanted to know you. <coughs> Did you get a nosebleed? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> Uh, but I wanted to get your views on um, super tall luxury living. Well, 432 is beyond super tall. But they're getting taller and taller, right? You got uh, mm, that not, whole... I don't think they're getting that high for a while. Right. Uh, I, 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 
I mean, we have very tall, uh, 220 Central Park South is going to be 950 feet or 70 feet, I can't remember exactly. It grows every week or so. Start. How many? 950. 950. And that's very, very tall. Mm -hmm. And some people enjoy being kind of captain of the universe. Personally, of course, we design buildings to suit circumstances, but if I had my brothers, I'd go much lower to have a sort of sense of the park uh, as a garden mm -hmm. in front of me. But um, the very tall buildings are a fact of life, and of course, uh, I like to think that our very tall buildings are interesting on the skyline and have different elevations on each side and have details, and on 220, you can already begin to see little balconies rising up um, uh, on the apartments above, shifts in the window patterning because the apartments are a certain number per floor in the lower part of the building, another part above. You can begin to project as a person looking at the building a life in the building. Mm. In 432, it's the pencil. <laughs> You know, you've had the opportunity to build individual buildings here in the city and you're restricted to some degree because of zoning and other restrictions. But, uh, you know, in places like Dubai and Songdo in Korea, and you guys are doing a major, a large project in China. That's Many the projects. In China. Uh, that, you know, that you're building entire communities. How is that, how is that different in terms of uh, design? The New York City zoning code is a walk in the park. Oh, really? Compared to China. <laughs> It's totally controlled. Every apartment has to have south facing. At least two hours of sunlight, but the way they interpret it just means every apartment has to have a south view, yeah. which makes for a very bad urbanism. Because if every apartment is facing one way, every building is facing one way, the other sides are kind of deadly. Right. And you only have to go to Shanghai or Beijing uh, to see what that is. So we struggle against that and we work with <coughs> pretty good uh, development clients in China like Vanke and others um, and they can uh, negotiate a certain amount with the local authorities but not that much. It's a very rigid society. Mm -hmm. And um, so the New York City, well, New York had a great zoning code in 1916. It was the most, it was the first and it was the best. It simply said you go up this high and you set back according to a plane. Right. And, and the height and the plane were proportionate to the width of the street. So a wide street like Park Avenue was one way, a narrow street like 37th Street had another. And that set up, everybody said, when I was in architecture school, oh, those step back towers, they're terrible wedding cakes. But think of all the fabulous balconies that those made and how beautiful skylines they made. So the architects, I am an architect, but I'm not always part of the architects. Uh, the architects wanted everything to look like the secret building, an object on a plaza. Right. They rewrote the zoning. And since 1961, mostly in the 70s and 80s, and I used to work on for planning for the Housing Development Administration when I was out of architecture school, we have been systematically undoing that 1961 plans, ordinance by ordinance, by interpretation by interpretation, which is why architects don't even know how to build a building without specialists who interpret the zoning. Right. It's become so complicated. If you went back to the 1960 ordinance, 16 ordinance, it was really simple. Mm -hmm. And you knew what to do. And we made incredibly tall buildings. The Empire State Building was pretty high, I sure. think, mm -hmm. under that ordinance. Adam Rose. Uh, Bob, talk about the tops of buildings, and I, I think the trend that was started probably by Philip Johnson and the Sony building, which started out called something else. I'm too old. at and Thank you, the at and building, uh, which I think everyone suddenly woke up and realized, oh wow, you could do something decorative on the <coughs> top of a building that hadn't really been done, and you've obviously given great care to 15 and 220. Talk about that. Well, the city, uh, um, the Corbusier, architect, I'm sure his name you know, and many of his works, came to the city and sometime after the Second World War and was invited to a very tall building, maybe in Rockefeller Center. And it was one of those cloudy days where the clouds were lower than the tops of the buildings, but his invitation was to above, to the top of the building, and he said, 
It's an amazing city. All the history of architecture is up here. And he admired that in a funny way. And so we have a whole city up in the sky. And people do enjoy it. And that's why people come to New York to see. They don't really come to see glass boxes. Um, and the, the, the vitality of these compositions, which usually involve extremely banal things like elevator overrides, water towers, or, think, or mechanical uh, penthouses. And then we, sh we struggle with our clients to find as many places for the people in the building. For example, now, I think it's a trend, and I welcome it. The rooftops are not being used exclusively for some guy who buys the top floor apartment, but for uh, amenities shared by other people in the building. Uh, um, uh, you can swimming pools with certainly little gardens, places to entertain, and I think that's great. But that orchestration of those elements concludes a composition, not just cuts it off. If you could uh, change three things about the, uh, with the New York zoning code, what would they be? And also, building code. Doug's speaking from major, major experience. Well, the building code, I don't have a comment on anything. Much of the building code is really about life safety. And uh, our standards of life safety have changed over time. Um, uh, and I, I'm not going to, frankly, I'm messing around with the building code. Uh, but the zoning code, I would go back so much more to a code that was based where the forms of the buildings were based on their physical situation, not on an abstraction. Not on an abstraction as an idea of a tower on a, on a billiard table, but uh, on a street. And also what was fascinating in the, when the original zoning was, if you were on a wide street here, you were facing Park Avenue here, but you were facing 53rd Street there. The zoning on 53rd Street was one way, and the zoning on Park Avenue was another. And that created really exquisite shapes that had to be made to figure out what to do. Dormers and all kinds, setbacks and twists and so forth that make buildings interesting. Just go and look at them. Uh, buildings that were built before 1940, or 19, but there wasn't much after 1940. So, and just compare them to the Seagram Building, which is a wonderful building. But 10 Seagram Buildings did we need? No. <laughs> <laughs> Why was it up? <laughs> To follow up on that, we had a, uh, we met with uh, Richard Meyer, and he was saying, like any architect that's putting out multiple projects every year, they can't possibly be doing anything that's their own, because it's not possible for a single architect to be able to do multiple projects in a year. So, you know, what do you say to that? I worked for Richard Meyer when I finished uh, architecture school, and he had one house, the Smith House, which was fabulous, and he had three or four people. We were only six all together; was a big office, right. um, <laughs> and they were doing everything. Yeah. Um, and Richard was all teaching at Cooper Union, mm -hmm. and he was trying to get other clients, so he'd have another house after the Smith. Right, sure. So even at that tiny scale, you have to have help. It's a collaborative art. And painters, do you think Jasper Johns or Andy Warhol or Rembrandt or Rubens painted everything? No. Uh, maybe Picasso did, but um, I don't know. I think he probably did, actually. Right. I don't think he had assistants, but most pay artists have assistants. Um, in the case of projects like 520 Park and 220 Central Parkside, you're designing for clients that are arguably in quite fierce competition with each other for similar buyers. Do you ever feel like you're stuck in the middle? Like, we'll see Roth say, you know, what's Architect of Europe doing with his entrance? I want to do something better. Let's put it this way. Developers are friendly at certain social occasions. <laughs> but back in their offices, they have interesting things to say about each other. I'm relatively discreet. <laughs> but we all got tricked. I mean, I think those two developers got tricked by the recession. We started these projects. And they started to think about them like in 2007, 2008, when 15 Central Park West was coming online. It was clearly a big success. Then the recession came, and then another recession came. And, um, so it's a trick. It also takes a long time to organize these sites. Vornado, Steve Roth, had a hell of a negotiation with Extel for the adjoining property. You all know that, um, public information. And the Zeckendorfs were assembling air rights from a church and the Grolier Club. 
that doesn't happen overnight. So these things take time. Um, but I think there's enough uh, difference between the projects, location, carbon configuration, and so forth. And there, I hope there are enough people who will be interested in each so that they both will be successful. Thank you so much, Thank you. Thank you for inviting me.